Hello, everyone, and welcome to my CHN podcast, Health Conversations Where Our Barriers. This is Mariela, and this is the CHN marketing team. Hi, I'm Lulu. Hi, I'm Benjamin. Hi, all. I'm Olga. And today we have a very special guest. We have the Behavioral Health Clinical Director, Demetra's mentor, but we call her Demi. Um, and she's an LPC, a licensed professional counselor, and a licensed chemical dependency counselor. Thank you for being here, Demi. Thank you for having me. I, I, I'm honored to be uh, with you all today. So today we're going to be talking about, it's about the rainbow candy fentanyl that lately has been showing up on the news. You see it on social media. You see it in a lot of other places. So Demi, could you tell us a little bit about what is fentanyl in the first place? So fentanyl is an uh, opiate, it, it is originally, it was a medication that was supposed to be used for breakout pain for people who have chronic long-term pain. Um, it is a hundred times stronger than morphine, 50 times stronger than heroin, and it is a fully synthetic opioid. Um, and so it, it's a painkiller, basically. So it is a prescription drug that has that is prescribed for, for, for patients that are suffering with chronic pain, but we know that it has broken out into where it is now also a street drug. What do you mean by long-term pain or, or chronic pain? Fentanyl, when they when they came up with fentanyl, so the strongest opioids that used to be, we're we're familiar with things like oxycotton, oxycodone, hydrocodone, um, morphine. These are things that were prescribed with people that were suffering um, from long-term chronic illnesses where they were in excruciating pain. And so they would be prescribed something in the hospital. It's also been used when people are going under uh, uh, anesthesia or when people after people have surgery. So when we say long-term pain, usually when they're prescribing fentanyl, they've already tried um, morphine, Dilata. Um, some of the other oxycotton, oxycodone, they've already tried those. And now fentanyl is the new, new, new player on the field. And fentanyl, like I said, it's very addictive and a lot stronger than the other pain relievers. So by the time they're prescribing you fentanyl, it is someone that may be on hospice um, and that is suffering from chronic pain. And so they just want to give them something basically to make them comfortable at this point. You don't have to be on hospice. So let me clear that up. Okay. Chronic pain doesn't have to be hospice, but someone who is suffering long-term chronic pain before they would prescribe you the fentanyl patch or, or other fentanyl um, derivatives. One of the things that we see also on social media is that they say that if someone has is really does not have any experience with opioids, like they have not taken it, if they touch a little bit of fentanyl, that they have an overdose. Is that something that you have seen or is it is it that people that taking fentanyl is because they are their bodies kind of used to taking opioids and is that why they don't um they either are able to take it and don't overdose or you know they overdose good question let me say it this way and so people build up whenever you use any drug over a period of time our bodies build up tolerance to that drug so building up tolerance means that it requires more of the same drug to get more of that drug to get the same effect that you initially got the first time you used it. So with fentanyl, because it's at the top of the line, remember I said it's stronger than heroin, than morphine, than oxycodone. So it's at the top of the line. So anyone that has not already been taking painkillers so that their body has built up a tolerance for it, if they go in touch, because it can be absorbed through your, through your bloodstream, if they go and touch fentanyl or play with the pills or God forbid, take it orally, then they're more likely to have to overdose because their body has not had, had time to build up tolerance. So that, that's why they're saying that they can overdose with just one, one, one touch of it, one taking it the very first time. Their body has no tolerance and probably would go into shock and overdose. Like you were saying, this is top of the line. That means it's prescribed by a, you know, a provider. So where is this, all this new one, where is the new fentanyl that they, we always see on TV? Where is that coming from? Do you know? I do. So, um, and there's some street names for fentanyl. 
um, that, that we'll talk about, um, but primarily from China, they're saying. So of course they can come from Mexico and, and other border towns, but primarily we hear of the China fentanyl, Chinatown, which that's even one of the names that they, street names they call it is Chinatown because that's the biggest place that is coming from this from China. Um, and, and we know that, that most drugs that are abused um, now in our time were originally prescribed are used for um, municipal purposes. And then people found a way to use to sell them illegally um, to get high from them for the euphoria. Um, but this, it was originally supposed to be for municipal purposes. Uh, yes, I just had a question as far as where it comes from. I know you say it comes from different places uh, like Mexico or China, but um, um, how do you know like how they get it? Like the cartel, like how are they getting this stuff to sell on the streets or are they making it themselves? They're making it. They, they are making this drug. This is a designer drug that they can make. And so it's a derivative. So like the other drugs, we know, when they came up with synthetic marijuana, um, which was originally legal because it is made up. It's taking some of the original drug and adding things to it to make it more potent, which also means make it more deadly and dangerous because we don't know how those drugs are going to, the additives are going to interact, the pollutant, actually, the, the poison. We don't know how those things are going to interact in our system. Um, and that's why some people feel like they can take it and they're okay. And other people, the very first time they take it, they die. For example, when you get something from your provider, you know, it tells you only take this once a day. How do they even know what kind of quantity are they making? Or they, I'm guessing they're just selling it just to, it doesn't matter how much they're, they're selling it, right? That's why there's so much on the streets. Let me, let me, let me put it this way, something that people can visualize. You know, a grain of salt. So when it comes to these fentanyl pills, two grains of salt, two little milligrams of that much salt is how much could kill us. That's how potent fent fentanyl is. So when they're mixing it and they're breaking it up and they're trying to, odds are, you know, if you take some salt and you're trying to sprinkle a little salt on something, how often do we go to sprinkle salt and we get more salt fallout than what we wanted to. I mean, that's it. I mean, you just wanted one little sprinkle, but three or four sprinkles actually fall out. They don't, it's not always the same amount of potency in every pill candy that they make. So when we're talking about them making the synthetic form of fentanyl, it's not like they're taking their time like a doctor to measure the correct proper amount and make sure it's the exact two milligrams, two milligrams. In every single, so you don't know what you're getting. One of the pills you take may have five in it, and your friend that's taking it beside you may have two. So you die, and maybe they don't. But it's it's like playing Russian roulette. Yeah, I had a question. You said, and I think this is important to note too, because most people are talking about um, actually using fentanyl. But you were mentioning that even if you touch it and it, and it enters your bloodstream, it can affect you. So uh, do you think that? that is something that we should be paying more attention to because more in the news, you're just hearing about like people ingesting it. You, so, uh, if I understand your, correct, your question correctly, you're asking, should we pay more attention to that? Yes, ma'am. Absolutely. It does come in pill form, but users usually will crush it up into a powder mm -hmm. form like cocaine or methamphetamine or something. And then they'll snort it nasally or take it in their finger and put it in their mouth. But just like cocaine and other drugs, it can be absorbed to not now it's not going to absorb to the same extent that it would if you take it more of the absorption. So, of course, if you shoot something directly into your bloodstream, if you take it nasally where you have more best blood vessels and things. So it's not going to hit you as quickly or as much as not going to be absorbed if you touch it than if you were to snort it or shoot it or something else. But it's still getting inside of you. It's still getting in your bloodstream. So if you didn't go wash your hands right away, and when 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 drug dealers are, are making it themselves, they wear gloves. And even in the air, the powder form, the mist in the air. So even if they're working in a lab or, or some building where it's closed in, even with their gloves on, they'll still have on masks, but they still probably get some of it absorbed in their body so that it's still, if they were to be tested, they, they would still come up positive. That's how strong it is. That's how serious it is. Oh, wow. That sounds very dangerous. So 
Aj, I have another question. So the prescription fentanyl, is it different from the ones that they sell on the street? And is that also can uh, lead to overdose? Absolutely. Yes, ma'am. So it is different. Keep in mind that street dealers are about making money. So they're not, they're not giving these pills out for health or for pain relief because somebody's having chronic pain. They're making money. So they're going to have additives, thanks to stretch the drug, so that they can make more money. So they may get the original form that a pharmacist would get and prescribe, but then they're going to crush it up in a whatever, whatever devices or whatever they use, and then add additives. And so the additives that they're adding make it even more dangerous and more potent because now we have interactions of drugs happening that are binding to our opioid receptors in our body that now are also affecting us, causing us breathing and respiratory problems, causing us to go into heart attack, causing us to have a seizure. Um, so yes, so it is different because they're going to add additional pollutants to try to stretch the drug so that they can make more money. But even, uh, just to make sure I 100% answer your question, Olga, even what's prescribed is highly mm -hmm. addictive and highly abusive. So even the original form of fentanyl that is prescribed by a doctor, which is how some people become addicts, unfortunately to say, someone who was in a major car accident and who were legitimately prescribed this pill, um, and maybe they abused it. Maybe the pain, whatever they were prescribed wasn't working. And so they said they're just going to take a little bit more because they're just trying to feel better. But keep in mind, our bodies is not basing off, becoming an addict is not based off of whether it's prescribed to you and you're taking it legitimately for pain or whether you're abusing it. Our body will still build up tolerance. And once we build up tolerance, then it's going to require more of the same drug to get the same effect. That means more of the prescribed drug to, for the pain, for me not to be in pain. So now if I'm taking more, I'm building up tolerance and I can become addicted just like a person on the street that's abusing it to become addicted. This is very scary. And I do personally know someone who actually got addicted to prescription drugs. So that leads me to a question. How can one protect themselves? So, you know, if you have that injury or you have that chronic pain, how do you make sure you don't uh, get addicted to the drug? Or is there is there any alternatives that are more safe? Well, that's where we have to rely on the professionals, the pro our professional prescribers that are looking at our labs and our blood work, looking at what we're being treated for. And keep in mind that professionals are always weighing benefit to cost, depending on like someone who's on hospice, who's chronic, who's you know, may not be going to live that long and they just want them to be comfortable and not to be in pain. That would be a different scenario than someone who's in a major car accident. And yes, they're in severe pain, but we don't want them to become addicted. So we're going to try the lesser medications that would not require them to become addicted, but still treats the pain. So now if I'm trying something not as strong, I would never, ever start with fentanyl. We're going to start with something that isn't as strong as fentanyl. We're going to to, to prescribe that would still manage the pain. Over time, if that isn't working, then that's when they have to try something else. So there are certain limits to how much a person can prescribe of any one set drug. Once it reaches a limit and a doctor says, I can't go any higher, I can't increase the doses of what you're on, they now need to switch to a different medication that affects the same risk pain receptors um, that may work better, but they're gonna start it at a lower dose. So they're not going to switch to a new drug at the same higher dose. So once I run out on this drug, you're still in pain, you're still suffering, you're still coming to me. I'm going to say, well, you know what? Let's maybe try something else. But you're at 150 milligrams on, on this medication. I'm starting you at two milligrams on this new pill that we're going to try and see how it works. We're going to monitor you closely. We're going to take labs. We're going to see how it's affecting your body and other organs. So when you're following um, the directions of a doctor who's a treatment team who is looking at you as a whole person, um, that's going to be your best defense to not become addicted to a drug. And I usually see. with prescription drugs, let me just add this so that, that people really have a true understanding. Because we do, we all may know someone that became an addict from prescription drugs. That is, I hate to say it, but it had become commonplace for a while. Um, oftentimes, People try to start to self-treat themselves. 
and they say, I'm just going to take a little bit more. Or it says take every six to eight hours and they take it at four hours. So now they're running out of the medications because the doctor prescribed enough for you to take it from six to eight hours. But if you're taking it every four, legitimately so that you're in pain and the pain is coming back quicker than what they expected. But what doctors do is that they give you a different lower dose of something that they say take in between. So they'll say take this every four to six hours and then take a Tylenol, ibuprofen, naproxen, or whatever they prescribe in between the time to kind of help stretch the medication, the stronger medication to make sure it's working. But what we do is sometimes we play doctor for, for ourselves. I'm saying too much. Yes, Miss Lulu. My question is when it comes to actually notice, like some people can manipulate and say and come in and say the pain isn't getting better and I would like a higher dosage. In that case, when it comes to like now giving them a new prescription, because ideally you would just believe them, I, I would think. How can you tell when they're manipulating and trying to get to the point where they get something higher because they're addicted? Well, that really depends on relationship. So it's very important that we have a relationship with and that, that our providers have a good bedside manner. So if I know my patient, they have no history, no substance use history of the past, because usually that would be, we would know that up front when we're going over their past history. So if you have a past history of addiction, I'm going to be aware of that. So we're going to be very careful as we're working together, but different ways we can manage your pain, different things we can do, different techniques, maybe some holistic things that you can do um, instead of just medication. It doesn't just have to be, that we're going to just throw medication at you for pain. There are other ways to treat pain. And so as a provider, I would make sure that I offered you other treatments, other ways, other things you can do to help manage your pain, other than just saying, we're just going to keep increasing your medication. But it is an individual thing. And that's why we always want to treat the whole person. We want to know the person we're working with um, so that we do due do, do diligence by them to help try to manage their pain to the best effectiveness we can. I want to know how do parents protect their kids, uh, teenagers, even young, young adults, you know, from fentanyl? Because now you have all this type of social media and maybe the, the parents are somewhat savvy, but they might not be that savvy. <sighs> wow. That is a really good question, particularly with Halloween coming. Um, we're hearing all this chatter and all these rumors, which may or may not be true. Um, but fentanyl is marketed to look like a candy. And not only that, so when you see the pictures of it, they look like the little sweet tarts. If everybody remember the little sweet tarts, they're a little bit smaller, but they still look like them. So for a child, they just see the pretty colors and they think candy and they want some candy. Um, but the other thing that they're doing now is they're actually putting fentanyl in Skittle boxes, in nerd boxes, which in regular candy boxes. So that's how they're marketing it now. That's how they're bringing it over here. So, I mean, think if you had a kid around the house and they love Skittles or nerds. And even if you told them they couldn't have any, you're not paying attention. And they figure they're going to get a few Skittles. You're not counting them. You wouldn't, you, you're not going to know. And, and, and that's very serious. And that's really what we want to be on the lookout for, um, particularly during this time of Halloween and holidays coming when candy is a big thing. I met mean, people used to have candy around the house for kids during the holidays. Um, so for, I, I encourage parents to educate themselves about and be aware of, of any candy that's brought in their house, any candy that's given to their kids. I don't care if it is nerds, Skittles, because those are the packagings they're putting in. They say, if you want to hide something, hide it in plain view. And that's and so that's what the drug dealers and cartels are thinking. Let's hide it in plain view and people won't think twice about it. But they're not thinking about the, the, the repercussions that come from that from kids. I don't think that they're, I don't know. I mean, you know, but I don't think that it's cartels or drug dealers intention to market, to get little kids to overdose and to get people. They're not thinking about them. They're thinking about their marketing strategy and what works. Like I said, if you want to hide something, hide it in plain sight. So that's their thinking and their goal. But the repercussion of that, the fallout, is that little kids see pretty colors that look like candy. So that, I mean, you know, kids, they, they try to steal a cookie out the cookie jar. 
They're going to try to get some Skittles or a sweet tart or what, not just kids. I mean, adults don't think either. We go and we grab, we see something sweet. I know I, I've done it. They'd be like, oh, huh. So that's what, what we really have to educate. That's the word we really want to get out to the public, um, particularly to parents during this season, is to be more aware of what your kids are getting, taking, what's given to them. Um, even if it's in a candy package, we cannot assume anymore. The things we used to take for granted, we just can't take for granted anymore. If it doesn't look right, if it doesn't smell right, if you didn't buy it yourself and know that it's right, I probably wouldn't give it to my kids right now. So I do an adolescent young person's group. And so for young people that are connected to juvenile or whatever, that's just trying to make extra spending money. So these drugs are circulated on the school grounds. They're just trying to make money. They don't know one way or another. But the thing is, is imagine if one of you, a teenager brought these home in their backpack not planning for their younger sibling to get it. Their plan is to sell it and make money. That's all they're thinking about. But younger siblings around the house, they go through their older sisters and brothers stuff. They're in their room messing with stuff. They're finding their little hiding places all the time. And that's why it's so important that families talk about this so that, because that, that would be devastating for one of their younger toddlers or siblings to get it. Once again, they see candy, they see pretty colors. But once they got it, they got it. And the damage is done. Uh, yes, on that uh, topic. Uh, so what are some of the symptoms associated with this? Like parents should be aware of, especially with Halloween coming up. Um, if a kid does take one of these, like what are some of the symptoms for them to keep an eye out on? Symptoms if a kid was to take one of these um, would be more like convulsions, seizure, eyes rolling back, um, rapid heartbeat. Increase anxiety. Now, if someone had tolerance and took it, those are different symptoms. So if someone is a regular, you know, have been abusing drugs or doing heroin and now they start started fentanyl, um, those are going to be different symptoms then. But when what you're asking is the symptoms are deadly. So we're, we're talking call 911 immediately. We're talking heart attack. We're talking symptoms that if you're, if you're not used to taking it, and I'm not just talking about children, I'm talking about adults and you take one of these, it's going to hit your body so rapidly, your, your opiate receptors, it's going to overwhelm your body. It's going to attack the middle part of your brain, the fight or flight, but it's going to attack your body in such a way that um, you're going to know you've got something that's not good for you, and it's a 911 call. However, there is something we can do to supersede that in the event that was to happen. I'll wait till we get to that part of, of the Actually, that was about to be my question. I have two. Um, I see that like some school districts are thinking about putting or bringing in, there's like a particular, I'm not sure if it's a drug or if it's a shot that you can give to kind of reverse a overdose. And they're thinking mm -hmm. about having that in schools. Do you think that that's something that most districts to be thinking about? And is that even something that is a good thing or should they be looking at how to take away fentanyl from schools? I think it is an excellent thing. And even President Biden spoke about it as harm reduction, as um, something he wanted to pass at harm reduction that we should consider. Um, it's called Narcan and we and it's an injection. Um, it's it's like, um, you know, if somebody gets stung by a bee or something and they're they're highly allergic to it and they shoot, they shoot them with that um uh, antihistamine or whatever. That's what Narcan is like that for this drug. And it can um, stop someone from overdosing or dying. And I think they should have it at school since this is being flooded into our systems, the kids. Um, I think Narcan should be on hand at all schools that if someone was having it, and even in families, having one at home, just like they sent us out the COVID kits. I think they should send families out a Narcan to have at home. I think it should be part of the first, this is just my personal views, of course. But I think it should be part of first aid kits that every first aid kit now should have Narcan. Oh, I was looking at the background of fentanyl and I was reading that um, sellers, uh, well, not sellers, but originally it was given as a lollipop um, to patients. Do you think that that is how the sellers are kind of, and that's how they thought about making it look like candy now so that it's easier to give 
And do you think that like it's the pharmaceutical companies? Like, do you feel like they're responsible a little bit for that, if that makes any sense? It does make sense if I understand your correction correctly. Um, you know, when the drugs, selling drugs and cartels and stuff, it's a business like any other business. And just like people sit in, in a room and they think of different marketing strategies and they pitch different marketing strategies for what's going to work. Um, so is it is it the pharmaceuticals? Is it the cartel? Let's put it this way. So for people who have cancer, long term chronic cancer, um, we know that they make um, Marinol, different, different, a different medical form of marijuana. There's all different forms. And so they're trying to make things more appetizing and pleasing to the eye for the people to use it. So always once we start something that's originally meant for good, there's always going to be a way to abuse it and for it to be misused. So can I say that it's pharmaceuticals fault that they made a lollipop? They also made a nasal spray. They also made a patch in fentanyl. So it's not just a lollipop. There's nasal spray. There's a patch. There's a pill. So there's different forms. And their goal is some people can't swallow. Some people can't, so they have to do the nasal spray. Some people, depending on whether they have throat cancer or something else. So for some people, a lollipop was a way that they could get the medication they needed because they couldn't take the pill. They, for whatever, couldn't take the nasal spray. The, I, I mean, I don't know. The patch was breaking them out in hives. Who knows? So somebody said, well, hey, let's make it, put it in a different form that would be um, adjustable, um, acceptable for the, for the patient we're trying to treat. We could go either way, and it would only be my opinion to say that it's their fault and that they were trying to get kids' attention, and that's how they came up with this other form. It's a marketing strategy, but it could be a good strategy for the patient, for the chronic patient that can only suck on a lollipop and has mouth sores or whatever and needs that, then it's a benefit and it's used correctly the way that it was intended to be used. But there were always, someone will always find a way to misuse things to their advantage. That's true. So. We're going to, I have one final question. And then just letting you guys know, you guys have no idea how many times I will find candy in my brother's backpack and I would take it. <laughs> now I'm thinking, okay, well, maybe that was not smart. Um, but my last question is what resources um, can we offer our audience um, if they know there's someone out there struggling with addiction and they would like to know more about how we can help them? So we here at CHN, one of the ways that we can help them is that um, we have a medication assistant treatment program, and that program is a medication treated, monitored, where we monitor you and we treat you with medication to help. This fentanyl is highly, highly addictive, and the withdrawals from fentanyl are excruciating. And so even people who, gen who genuinely, truly want to get off once they're addicted and they built up tolerance, they may have a true desire that they really want to quit using and get their life together. But that when that those withdrawal symptoms hit them and they're in chronic pain, their next thought, the first thought that hits their mind is, I just want to get out of pain. And so there's not a lot of things that can take away that. Remember, we're already at the top of the line of the pain relief. So I can't go take a Tylenol. I can't go take Motrin 800. None of that's going to work. So. That means that I'm going to get more of that drug because I, it ain't. it's not about getting high anymore. At this point, I just want to feel better. I don't want to be sick all day. I don't want to be moaning and groaning all day. So I'm more likely to stay addicted and keep searching the drug out. However, here at CHM, we have a medication-assisted treatment program, and we offer um, Suboxone, which has been known to it, heroin people who are opiate addicts, are able to take Suboxone and, and keep in mind that fentanyl is just a different type of pain reliever in, in that same family. It's stronger than heroin, but Suboxone works the same way. So even if you and your provider started you at a stronger amount to, to supersede what a, maybe a heroin addict, someone who came in that was addicted to heroin for a while, we do offer that here at CHN. I encourage you guys to go to our website, which will be posted for anyone who's interested. Um, please call us. We are here to help and we can help you kick this habit and get your life back on track if that's what you desire to do. So please reach out to us. You do not have to suffer in silence. There's no judgment. Um, however you got on this drug, whether it was through an accident and chronic pain, however you come, the important thing is to just come.
help is available to you. Thank you, Demi. Thank you for being a part of our podcast. We would love to have you again. And then don't forget to demonstrate your love by sharing this podcast with your friends or family and giving us a review on Spotify or iTunes. Until next time.